I mean, the types of false allegations can, or act, accusations when you're dealing with narcissists are really endless. I mean, completely infinite. And honestly, the funny thing is they will contradict themselves over and over and over again. That's the thing that's really interesting and, and also very, very helpful for you because this is where you can start building your leverage. And this is where my slay methodology will very, very much help you. Strategy, leverage, anticipate where they're going to go, be two steps ahead of them and focus on you, your case and your position. That's what the slay methodology is. And it will very much help you because they are liars. And you know what judges hate more than anything? They hate liars and narcissists are lazy. They're also very, very lazy. They also ignore court orders and judges hate lazy liars who ignore court orders and narcissists are all of those things. And I'll tell you that at the end of the day, if you are just diligent in keeping track of these things, you really will be able to catch them. And so the thing that you have to remember is to just keep your wits about you and, and remember who you're dealing with and not allow them to get the best of you. Understand who it is that you're dealing with. And every time they do one of those things that they do, just say, thank you very much. You just gave me something else. Understand that what it is that you're building. You have to play a little bit of the long game. All right. So I'm going to give you six ways to deal with the narcissist's false allegations, but just understand that yes, they do this. Yes. They're trying to trigger you. Yes. They're trying to get you to look like the crazy one. That's why they do it. They want you to be triggered, number one, because they get supply from it. Number two, they want you to look like the crazy one. So when you get sucked into that mud and you react, they go, oh, look, you're the crazy one. And you, you took that bait, hook, line, and sinker. They use your reaction against you. And there you go. Don't get sucked into it. So that's number two. And then number three, as long as you are giving them that supply, as long as they catch that fish, they will never leave you alone because you are giving them that supply. So you don't want to go into it because of that as well. All right. Six ways to deal with the narcissist's false allegations. Number one, you can respond. Do not react. Do not react. And I know you know that that was where I was going, right? You know, it's like they got the fish. <laughs> Do not give them that. Unless you want to be that fish that they have reeled in. Don't be that for them. You know, you can respond. Do not react. Just picture yourself. You're that fish that they've reeled in. Okay. Don't be that. So that's one way to deal with the Narcissist false allegations. Number two, make sure to document, document, document. And in my slay program, I have the 12 areas that you should be documenting. I have a whole chart on that and I have a whole module on this, but make sure that you are being very, very diligent on how you are documenting and do, do it in real time. Please do yourself a favor and do it in real time. It is so hard to go back and try to recreate, oh, what was that? What day was that? And they do, they give you so much material. They really do. I remember a case one time where, you know, the wife threw the son, it was like a 14 year old son, threw him out of the house at, you know, four o'clock in the morning. Just she had a big fight with the son like in the middle of December, it was like cold out. This husband had to go pick up the son and she sends the husband 
an email saying, yeah, it's probably better if we take some time apart from each other, you should call the school bus service and have the bus start picking him up at your house, you know, for now. And then the next thing you know, the lawyer gets a motion saying that husband has been withholding son from wife and all of this stuff. When there's an email out there that says, you know, you should call the bus service. I mean, it's like mind blowing, you know, but this is the kind of thing that they do. So that's why you document, 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 you keep it in a file. You know, you just have all this stuff, you have it ready to go so that you don't have to go back. You don't have to go look for all this stuff. What day was that? You know what I'm saying? Keep track of it in real time. And I have a whole other video, by the way, on how to keep your cool against narcissists. Definitely check that out too. So that's number two. Number three is don't get sucked into the mud. Do not get sucked into the mud. Start looking at it as if you're a third party. You know, try try starting to look at it as if you're an observer. I have a video where I was interviewing Judge Lynn Toller from Television's Divorce Court. And she talked about that too, where you just start looking at it as if you're looking at something happening. Oh, I see that you're upset. Oh, I see that, you know, you are unhappy about something. You want to tell me more about that? You know, because you have to understand that these are people who are just deeply unhappy and that that's what you're dealing with. So, you know, don't, don't be surprised when they act like themselves, be surprised if they act normal. Okay. So that's number three way to deal with a narcissist, false allegations. And then number four is become like Teflon when it comes to those guilt trips. You know, they're going to try to guilt you into things a lot of times, you know, that's another way that they try to suck you in to the, this thing. You know, one way, of course, is they try to trigger you by getting you angry or saying things. But another way is they try to guilt you into it. Oh, you know, I thought maybe you might want to take care of your family, or I thought that you were a better mother than that, but I guess not, you know, something like that. Don't go for the guilt thing either, you know, become like Teflon, you know, stand in your power, you know, what's right. Just remember, you know, keep your focus on what you know to be fair, what you know to be what's right, what you know to be what's equitable. Don't allow their manipulation to to get inside your head anymore. Because a lot of times the voices inside your head, especially if you've been with this person for a long time are their voices and not your voices and not the voices of what's reality or what's your own voice. And, and that's why, you know, you've got to create these boundaries and you've got to start staying away from them and keeping your interactions as brief and unemotional as possible and just not allowing them to penetrate your space. So don't allow them to penetrate. Okay. So that's number four. And by the way, if you agree with me so far on all of this, give me a spot on in the comments, just say spot on so far. And number five, number five is use one method for communications. And again, this is your way of not allowing yourself to be attacked from 50 different directions, right? So you're going to use one method for communication and it really should be just email or an app. If you have children, you can use an app. Again, they may try to goad you. They may try to say, oh, you know, why do you have to be so rigid? We can talk in different directions. We can talk. How come we can't, you know, just meet somewhere or whatever, especially because, you know, they're going to try to push the boundaries, push 
the different directions. Just don't do that. Don't engage. Just say, you know, no, we're, we're going to use one form and it's going to be email, you know, and if you have kids, an app is great. And I do recommend especially having it turned into a court order because that way, if they don't use the app, you can file a motion for contempt or whatever, because, you know, they're, they're going to push the envelope and, and you need to start to heal and you need to start having time away because that's where you'll start to be able to move away from this whole situation. Okay. So that's the fifth way that you get to deal with a narcissist false allegations. One method for communication that can be tracked. And finally, the last way is try not to ever be alone with the narcissist because they'll say things. I mean, I had a client one time who they did the exchange and with the child and then after they did the exchange with the child, the husband wrote in the, the app, thanks for agreeing to switch weekends next weekend. I really appreciate that. That conversation never even took place. I mean, it was wild stuff, you know, but that's what they do. That wasn't a false allegation. It was just a false conversation, but that's, that's what they do. It's like a wild odyssey when it comes to dealing with narcissists. So, you know, really try not to be alone with the narcissist. If you can try to do your exchanges in front of other people, if possible, you know, I recommend parallel parenting plans when you're dealing with narcissists, meaning, you know, you just try to have as little interaction as possible do your exchanges at schools, meaning drop off in the morning, pick up in the afternoon, just try not to have, ever have to see each other, do all of your interaction through the app. I mean, as far as the communication goes. So those are six ways that you can deal with a narcissist, false allegations. Basically, you're just trying to make sure that there's always a way that you can prove things. And as I said, you know, there are always ways that you can beat narcissists in court. It's actually very easy to beat narcissists in court. Okay. So I want to get into the judicial system. I have a huge community and a lot of people say the judicial system is broken. Um, it, it favors narcissists. Uh, what would you say about that? I don't think the judicial system favors narcissists any more than any other system that the narcissist engages in. In other words, they take no prisoners and they don't back down and um, a certain amount of fight will behoove you or inure to your benefit no matter what system you're in. The system is designed to level the playing field that everybody should have the same rights. It's supposed to be, you know, the, the young lady with the balance and the, and, 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 and the, and, uh, you know, blinded to who's before them. Simply, it should be the issues and right or wrong. But narcissists can bully anybody and judges can be bullied too. They're just people. But I think they try very hard. First of all, they won't know he's a narcissist off the bat. You or she. He or she, that's right. He or she is a narcissist off the bat. So they have to learn that and figure it out. So uh, it takes time. You, The person who comes in already knows, but the judge doesn't know. So it takes some time to figure that out. And don't get in the habit of trying to one-up the narcissist before the judge and the outrage, because judges will, in the beginning, if they could, if they see it, they, they can take it into account in, in what they say and what they hear and what they believe and, 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 and who has the more rational sense about them. So rationality should will out in most circumstance. It won't seem that way in the beginning because the judge needs run up time. Yeah, I mean, I tell people all the time that the, the court system is beleaguered in a lot of ways. Oh. I mean, judges have way too many cases on their dockets and they, and I tell people that they do get evaluated on how often they get appealed. 
uh, and and what the res re result is of the appeal if they, right. if they get reversed. And they also are evaluated on how quickly they move cases off their dockets. Yeah. And so I think that judges feel a tremendous amount of pressure. Um, would you agree with me on that? Oh, absolutely. And, and the system, to that extent, the system is broken. And I think that we as a society has asked the judicial system to uh, fix a lot of things that what it wasn't designed to fix. You have waves of social ills and these waves of divorce and stuff. And we, we are, the system wasn't designed for that. It was designed for the peculiar, odd thing. And now everybody's running the court all the time. So uh, yes, yeah. it is an overwhelmed system. No yeah, more. yeah. I mean, you know, depending on whatever the filing fee is, $400 or whatever, my husband always says, anybody can file anything if they have $400 burning a hole in their pocket. And they do. <laughs> and they do. <laughs> I mean, and the other thing that it, it is that I'd love for you to speak on is I talk often about the difference between divorce law and divorce justice, right. you know, and, and that is, you know, judges are tasked to apply the law that's their job that's your job they're not tasked to you know punish somebody because they cheated because you know they left the other person or something like that can you talk more about that i'm i'm, I'm going to say something about my bias i think the legislator punted a little bit uh, especially in, in community property states where and that's not our job to say who was right and who was wrong. Some states have gotten the idea of uh, marital misconduct, which I'm sure you know about uh, when, you know, I've spent all my, my money on my, my mistress. And so that won't be, you know, so, so you can make some accountability for bad behavior. But for the most part, the justice system is not interested. It is no fault. And it is simply an unwinding of economics and, and property. And it is unrelated to the conduct that caused the, the crisis in the first place. So you have to get next to that in the very, very beginning, especially if you've been dumped upon in the process of the marriage. Totally, totally. I mean, I will say, and I'd love to get your opinion on this too, and I tell people all the time that no fault simply doesn't, it, it, it means that you don't have to prove fault in order to get a divorce, right? right? So, but, but it doesn't mean fault never matters. I mean, I, and I tell people that judges are humans. And so if you shock the judicial conscience, uh, <laughs> you know, you can, the, the judges can develop a bias yeah. um, because they're making decisions about who's, who, who to believe or not. Can you right. talk more about that? Yeah, it, it, we are making decisions about who to believe. And I will, I, I, will, I will cop to another concern that I have about the system is I think judges need to be better trained to, to uh, separate themselves from their own emotionality. Uh, you know, it's like I was 34 years old when I took the bench. They gave me a robe and set me in the chair and said, good luck to you, sweetie. And um, I learned throughout the time there that I had to separate how I felt about something because it may be a function of something that's happened to me personally. Because as like I think Benjamin Cardozo said, it's like the 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 waves of emotion don't just get up and 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 pass the judges by. We do feel things, and we have to be able to separate how we feel and how what we are seeing makes us feel from what we are really doing, what we really need to do. Yeah, it, it, and you know, but it's not always easy, right? Because you're- Oh, it's never easy. Yeah, because your emotions are so close to you and you feel far faster than you think. And if you are, it, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to, to eradicate your emotional response to everything. But I think that given better training, I think the police and judges, uh, we can deal with our emotional biases, prejudices, fears in order so we don't pass them along or or we don't see them through the prism of those of those peculiarities or uh, peccadillos. Yeah. So a lot of people are concerned that the narcissist is going to lie to the judge over and over again, and I've seen them lie, right. um, and I've seen them get away with their lies. Right. Um, and you know, there have been times when I've seen them say one thing, and and then twenty minutes later on the stand say something different. 
and yet the judge ruled for them. I mean, as a lawyer, it can be very frustrating myself as well. You know, and I think, did you not just notice the inconsistency over there? Like what's going on? But a lot of people are concerned. And so I would love for you to weigh in on what advice you would give to people who are going, I feel like I can never win because they're just going to lie. Um, hopefully most judges will, ca- you know, cause you, if, especially if you lie early and we catch you, you know, uh-huh, we, we don't, you know, it, it, it diminishes the trust we have in you all together once we caught in a lie. So the calm and continued, uh, exposition of what is going on by the attorney. And sometimes it, it, you got to remember, it took you a minute to figure out that he was, he or she was a narcissist to begin with. And it's going to take a judge a minute as well. Oh, that's so true. That's a really you good see what point. I'm saying? You, when you met, you met him and married him. That's so <laughs> true. What a really good point. That is such a good point. Um, you know, and what I tell people to do is, you know, create summaries of their lies and inconsistent statements, you know, like have a text message that says this on one day and another thing that says this, and it makes it easy for the judge to go, oh, okay, I can see the story here. Right. You know, so would you agree with that? That's how oh, absolutely consistent papering of, of what is occurring and to put it in because you 20 minutes on my docket today. So if you put it in, if it's just all over the place, I can't get there with you. But if it's concrete for me, I can get there. Yeah, that's perfect. I love that. And so, okay, so here's another question that I get a lot. Um, people think if the judge, they've been in front of the judge a couple of times, maybe it's been on a discovery motion, or maybe it's been on a motion to compel or a motion to enforce an order or something like that. And the judge has ruled against them. So now they think that the judge is favoring the narcissist, that they're, they, they're biased, they, they want to get rid of the judge or whatever. What, what would you say to that? Always talk to your attorney first because there's a lot of reasons you can lose a motion and not necessarily be a function of a factual determination made uh, in favor of the narcissist and against you. There could be legal reasons why it is. And so really talk to your attorney and talk to your attorney with the, uh, with the understanding that you're trying to determine what it was that made the motion unsuccessful on your part, because you'll go first to the thing that bothers you the most, which is their narcissism, narcissism, but you have to be able to really understand. Sometimes you lose emotion because of the legal uh, particulars of it. And sometimes it's because of the lie the narcissist told, but in order not to get consumed by that, you have to really listen to your attorney and come to their attorney with a clear head about, I'm going to accept what she or he or she is telling me about the reasons that our motions were denied or uh, granted. And it's not always the end of the story either. Nope. I mean, because, you know, as, as you go in front of the judge more and more, oftentimes it gets turned around. Oftentimes mm-hmm. the judge- Patterns emerge. <laughs> Say it again. Patterns emerge. Exactly, exactly. And the judge starts to see, but it's it's really hard. And, and I, I want you to speak to this as well, which is, you know, if, if somebody just comes in and says that person is a narcissist, what would you say to that? I, you know, I need evidence. I don't need conclusions. And I think that some people do come up with that person's a narcissist and they may, may they could be a jerk, or a full, you know, they're 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 different levels of jerkdom, and ju- you know, you not necessarily uh, diagnosable just because you're some level of a jerk. So don't come in screaming the 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 concern of the day. I'm not the con- narcissism isn't the concern of the day, but it's it's the new. Uh, it's the word du jour. Yeah, it, it, it really is. is saying it. And so, and, and what I tell people is that, you know, it's, it's almost like two kids fighting, you know, like if you're a parent and both kids come in, she started it. No, she started it. No, she's the jerk. No, he's the jerk. But the judge is just like, oh, both of you stop it. <laughs> I, yeah. So don't come in here saying, making diagnoses because 
you know, don't come in crazy, come in calm with me. If you come in all wild and out with all of the extremities, you know, you have to, you got to come in cool because I will listen longer and harder. And, oh. and if, okay. if you're normally a rational and calm person and there's some exaltation later on, I will, I will see it more as a circumstance that is, that arose as a function of events as opposed to, as opposed to tag you with hysterical, crazy dude or chick. So let's talk about you and your lawyer and your relationship with that lawyer. I'm quite familiar. I've represented lots and lots of people over my many years. And I can tell you that most of the time you do want to tell your lawyer absolutely everything. And for those of you who've read my book, uh, you know, Breaking Free, a step-by-step -step divorce guide, I have a whole chapter in there, right, about how to pick a lawyer, how to find your lawyer. And then I even, in my SLAY program, walk you step-by-step -step through how to find a lawyer and also questions for vetting a lawyer when you're dealing with a narcissist. 99.9% .9 of lawyers do not understand narcissism. And so it is hard to find a lawyer that is dealing with, that understands what you're dealing with. But most of the time, you do want to tell your lawyer absolutely everything. And let me just make sure that that is really super clear. Because I've had horror stories. I mean, whatever you're trying to hide from your lawyer, I guarantee you that the other side probably knows about it and you will be hearing about it and it will probably be at a very inopportune time, like when you're sitting in front of a judge or, some, or a mediator or something like that. And then here comes this information that you were trying to hide from your lawyer and now your lawyer has no idea how to handle it, what to say, how, what to do, and is caught and doesn't know how to spin it. So most of the time, you do want to tell your lawyer absolutely everything because then your lawyer will have an opportunity to spin whatever, even if it's totally bad, like a really, really what we call bad fact, then we can spin it. We can figure out a way. We can get out in front of it. So, you know, like I had a client one time who was actually a really great guy, but he kind of lost it. At the beginning of the case, he found out his wife was had spent the night with another guy and had lied about it. And he found out where she was and he went and, uh, while she's sleeping, you know, and upstairs with the guy, he slashed her tires. Okay. Or he did something to, you know, take the air out of her tires. And, you know, that was what we call a bad fact. Like, that's not really something you really want to have to like have a conversation about, but had he like, what ha would have happened if he didn't tell me? Well, we would have been sitting there in court and there would have come that information and I'd have been looking over at him going, um, excuse me, is that where you're talking about the same person? Yeah, I mean, that's not good, right? So, you know, you have to get a chance to spin that and get out in front of that. That's so much better for your lawyer. And definitely do not ever lie to your lawyer, by the way, had that situation happen too. Uh, and, you know, I had a case where the client had told us that this joint account or this uh, account that had some money in it had been deferred compensation that was prior to him marrying this current wife. And so it was non-marital and blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, I'm making this argument in front of the judge and on a break during the trial, he leans over and says, by the way, I lied about that. It was actually marital money. It actually was money that I made during the marriage. Like, um, excuse me, like, this is not a good time. This is not the good time. No. So you do want to be honest with your lawyer and you do want to tell your lawyer everything, even if it's like yucky stuff about you. Um, I guarantee you, your lawyers probably heard it before. There's so little that actually shocks me nowadays because I've heard pretty much everything. So most of the time you do want to tell your lawyer absolutely everything. And if you are so ready to have the information that you need to get out of this relationship and break free, give me a break free in the comments. 
So, I mean, sometimes you can have a lawyer that's not the greatest lawyer too. And, you know, you're trying to tell them things and, or maybe they're not listening to you or whatever. And if you want to know more about when it's time to fire the lawyer that you have or get out of the relationship of the lawyer, with the lawyer that you have, um, check out my video on signs that it's maybe time to fire your lawyer. Lots of good information in there. So let's talk about what you should not really just say to your lawyer. And, and that's where I come down to, you just don't want to say anything to your lawyer that it's going to cause your lawyer to lose confidence in you as a person. Meaning you don't want to just say, you know, that person is crazy, or that person's a narcissist, or that, uh, the, these kind of big pronouncements like that without like backing it up is actually not going to be helpful for you. Because if you come across as really, really emotional and uh, you're just saying things and you're spewing things, your lawyer is actually going to start to be like the rest of the world and not necessarily believe you and not necessarily have your back. So you don't want that to happen. You don't want your lawyer to actually start turning on you. And, you know, another thing that can kind of make a lawyer start to turn on you is um, if you start questioning things that they're doing, if you start um, questioning every little thing. I mean, I had a client who called me up one time and said, I have a friend who has a, a friend who's a paralegal in Maine, and they want to know why you're not doing this, this, and this. And I'm like, I think that you should hire the paralegal in Maine. That's what I think that you should do. I mean, because your lawyer at that point is just going to be like, I, I don't want to have to deal with you. And you don't want your lawyer to get to a point where they don't want to have to deal with you. Okay. And, and, you know, just by calling people a narcissist or whatever, it's fine to say that, you know, but also have, be ready with backup. You know, what, what will make you a favorite of your lawyer is if you are, you know, controlled, that you are, um, specific, that you give good information, that you um, are respectful of their time. Don't be demanding. You know, I had a, a client call me up one time and she talked to my paralegal who told her that I was on my way in and uh, I had had a, an early morning doctor's appointment. It was like nine o'clock when she called. And my paralegal made the mistake of telling this woman that I had had a doctor's appointment and that I would be in, in shortly. And the woman actually like spouted like, oh, I wish I had time to go to the doctor, you know, and, and all this other stuff, like basically saying I shouldn't be doing anything other than working on her case. That's the kind of thing that kind of turns your lawyer off, that makes you, your lawyer be like, I don't really want to have to deal with that client. I mean, the bottom line is, even though you're paying the lawyer, the lawyer is a person and they don't want to have to deal with people who are attacking them or difficult or anything like that. So, you know, do make sure you tell your lawyer everything, but also be respectful of the relationship. Make sure that when you are saying things that you are coming across credible, that you have backup, that you have supporting documentation, that you can walk them through. Um, it's really, really helpful if you have all of your documents in an organized fashion and that you get them to your lawyer on time. And if you have lots and lots of questions for your lawyer, do not send them like a hundred emails a day because some lawyers bill for every single one of those, first of all. But second of all, it's not, it's very hard for, for lawyers to keep up with all of that. Better to say, can I schedule a telephone conference with you? I have some things that I want to go over with you, or can I schedule a meeting with you? And then you know, keep notes of all the things that you want to talk to your lawyer about and, and talk to your lawyer about all of them at the same time. So, um, those are your kind of do's and don'ts on what to do to make sure that you have a good relationship with your lawyer. You want that lawyer to be 
on your side, to have your back, to really feel personally passionate about making sure that you get the outcome that you deserve. And that doing what I'm saying in this video will help you to be set up and, and be put in a place where that can potentially happen. Now, if you're getting ready to go to court with the narcissist, whether it's divorce court or otherwise, you're going to want to be fully prepared and you're definitely not going to want to walk in without having the best possible strategies and tactics at your fingertips because this is going to be no cakewalk. The narcissist is going to make it as difficult for you as possible. So stay tuned and listen to the end so that you can get all the tips and you'll be all ready to go. All right, number one. Number one is have everything that's possible to be in writing, be in writing because narcissists by their nature are pathological liars. So they are going to lie about things that you said, you didn't say, conversations that took place or didn't take place, what they said or didn't say, whatever it is, it's going to be twisted, it's going to be, be, be manipulated. So you wanna make sure that you can keep everything in writing to the extent that that's possible. So, and, and ideally it would be like in an email or something like that where you actually have um, the time stamp on it, you have the date stamp on it, you have the email, who it came from, the email address of who it came from, who it went to, that sort of thing. Text messages are admissible in court nowadays, but it's just a little bit more difficult to authenticate them when it comes to evidence in court. So it is better if you can do it via email if possible. The other problem with text messages is that they tend to go away after a certain period of time. Um, and especially if you don't save them, it's really difficult to go back and find them. The, the phone companies don't even really keep them either. So you're definitely going to, going to want to make sure that you use email if possible. If you're co-parenting, having a co-parenting app such as Talking Parents or FAIR or uh, Our Family Wizard, something like that is always a good idea too. I mean, the bottom line is that they're going to try to get you away from this writing. They don't want to be in writing because they know that it will box them in and narcissists don't want to be boxed in. So they're going to do whatever they can to get you to meet with them, to, um, to go against what you said before, things like that. They're, they're just, you know, let's just meet. We don't need the writing. We don't need... Um, all these other people around us, you know, let's just uh, meet at Starbucks or whatever. And, and the reason why they're doing that is to get you into a place where they can manipulate you again. So by keeping everything in writing as much as possible, um, you can minimize that problem. Now, what the flip side of this, by the way, is for you to remember that every single writing is a potential trial exhibit. So if you don't wanna see it again, then don't put it in writing. The way I just say it to people is, you know, just imagine the judge is, is leaning over your shoulder and watching you write that text or that email. And before you hit send, say, you know, judge, your honor, is this something that you would want to see? And if it's not, then you don't want to send it. Okay, the second thing that you're going to want to do is use video for depositions. And the reason why you're going to want to do this, and yes, it's a little bit more expensive. You have to pay for the court reporter. Now you have to pay for the videographer. But it goes back again to boxing that narcissist in. If you box them in enough, then they will act like the spoiled temper tantrum child and their true colors will show up and you'll be able to use that against them down the road. So, but, you know, it, it just trying to control their behavior using video will definitely help because if you don't use video what they tend to do is do things that don't show up on the record meaning the court reporter will take down everything that's actually said in the deposition when you look at the deposition transcript it'll it'll just say question blah 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 answer blah 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 there's nothing around it. There's no description given around it. So if that narcissist is giving you dirty looks, making faces, all the things that they do, and they do, then um, it, nothing is taken down. Now, for me as a lawyer, there have been many times where I've had to say, let the record reflect that so-and-so is making faces at so-and-so. 
But, you know, how many times can the lawyer do that over and over again without just constantly interrupting the deposition? So by videoing it, you actually see what, um, how they're responding and how they're acting. Plus, it makes them behave a little bit better because they're a little less likely to be a complete jackass if there's a video shining in their face. If this is all sounding really good to you so far, put a thumbs up in the comments. Okay, number three is focus on your own case. So this is one of the biggest mistakes that I see lawyers make. I see lots and lots of people make because it's just natural to want to focus on what's the other side doing and, and all of their flaws and all of their mistakes and how is he or she getting away with this and look at how badly they're behaving and isn't the judge going to see that? And, and the answer is maybe and probably, and yeah, you will want to bring out all of the other bad behavior of the other side. But, you know, just like in football, if you, all you have is a good defense and you have no offense whatsoever, then you never score any points, right? So you want to make sure that your case is as strong as possible. Focus on your case. Make, the, make sure that the facts and the supporting documentation and everything is done to create your case and make sure it's super strong. And then for the other side, you create that leverage to help motivate them into wanting to come to the table to potentially have a settlement conversation with you. Or, you know, you have all the points that make them look bad. Yes, you know, anything that shoots their credibility you know, it, it, when people say, oh, how are they getting away with this? They're lying all the time. Why, how are they getting away with this? So the thing I want you to remember, here's a good reality check for you. And that is who would stop them from getting away with something? The only person who has any power over another human being in the court system is the judge, not the lawyers, not you not family members, no one has the power to order someone to do anything other than the judge. And how do you get in front of the judge? Through motions, through hearings, through trials, things like that. Things have to be filed in the court system and then you have to have a hearing, bring it to the judge's attention, and only at that point can you potentially rein in their behavior. But while you're waiting for that time to get in front of the judge, you're just documenting, you're keeping track, keeping track, keeping track. So that's how you're building your case. If you're dealing with a child custody uh, situation, for example, and the person just never shows up to, to get the kids, or they show up late, or they constantly change the time, you just document it, document it, document it. And then when it comes time to present that to the court, you have a nice log of exactly what happened and when, what time did they show up, what time did, did they leave, you know, all of that. So eventually it will work in your favor. But just remember that you want to keep track of your own case and, and make sure that that is bolstered as much as possible and then highlight the weaknesses of the other person as well. Okay. Number four is what I started to allude to in number three, which is document, document, document. And I cannot stress this enough. Keep really careful notes. Have an app open on your phone. Have um, a journal, a log, whatever you need to do so that wherever you are, real time, you can be logging what's happening. And I have won entire cases on these types of logs. Let me tell you, they do work it is critically important so make sure that you're documenting because what you're doing is you're slowly closing in on your narcissist from every angle it's it's you know it, it this is war this is the art of war and so you're you're building these tactics and and you're closing in on them from various different angles and it doesn't look like you're doing much until you've got them fully surrounded and that's when you realize Hey, I, I have them. And only then is when they're going to want to start to have a conversation with you about potentially settling the case um, and not having to go to court. Because you, you know that the main thing about a narcissist is that they don't want to look bad. 
I have a lot more on this in my videos on how to negotiate with a narcissist and how to negotiate with the narcissist ex. And I will drop links below to those videos. You'll definitely want to check those out. Okay, number five, definitely do very thorough research. Have everything ready to go. Do you need appraisals? Do you need valuations? Do you need a forensic accountant? Do we need to figure out what the person's true income is by looking at their bank, bank records? Do we need to figure out a lifestyle analysis by looking at credit card statements and bank statements and things like that? Everything needs to be ready to go, all I's dotted, all T's crossed. Don't leave any stone unturned. Don't leave anything to winging it because whatever your weaknesses are, wherever there, there's that weakness in your case, that's where they're going to find you. And that's where they're going to jam their foot in and open that door and make it into a big, huge thing. So also in being prepared, you're going to want to make sure that you do all the research for the other side. What are they going to argue? What points do they have against me? What leverage do they have against me? And then be ready to answer that. I anticipated this argument and here's my response because if you're only prepared for your side, then you are only half ready to go. So make sure that you are ready for both sides as if you're preparing for both sides. And one word about leverage, by the way, is make sure that once you've got that leverage, you use it at the most opportune time. Do not give it away too early. Do not show it to them before you get to court because you want to use it when you need it. All right, so the last one, number six, is to keep your emotions in check. And this is going to be one of the hardest things to do because narcissists know how to push your buttons and they know how to manipulate you. So they're going to make faces, they're going to make little snarky comments, they're gonna say things under their breath. And, um, you know, so I would totally avoid making eye contact with them in the courtroom it's not going to serve you just look at the judge when you're when you're testifying just look at the judge make sure, sure that you've practiced your testimony i as an attorney go over my direct testimony with my clients if your attorney doesn't do that as a matter of course ask your attorney to do that with you um, or ask them for the questions and have somebody else practice it with you you want to just be able to at least control the parts that you can control, which is your direct testimony. You should basically know what those questions are going to be. The, 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 your attorney will be asking you those questions and um, be ready with what you're going to say so that you're not stumped and you're not feeling nervous and, and anxious. You know exactly, okay, this is that question. Here's how I, I planned to respond to it. I mean, of course, you're going to answer truthfully. You just want to be prepared on how you're going to, to uh, word your answers, how you're going to say it, what things you want to make sure to get in, what things you want to make sure to say, things like that. So, um, so that's uh, your direct testimony. Now, as for your cross-examination, you should also see if your lawyer, I, I know I usually do this as a matter of course, I tell my clients what to expect for cross-examination too. Um, I even sometimes get another lawyer in my office to do a mock cross-examination with the person and sort of beat them up a little bit, just so that they're ready. You know, the kinds of questions that I would ask under cross-examination, something like that. So the more you can be prepared, the less emotional you will be, the less anxious you will be. But it, it you know, it does, um... I think that the idea of watching your tone becomes critical. I mean, you know, listen, I know no, no one can ever stop an emotional state. Emotions are natural. You never want to keep them. You never want to bottle them up. But you've got to learn how to channel them. And watching tone becomes critical. Because it, ironically, it's almost like a way a dog can hear frequencies the rest of us can't hear. Narcissists can hear tone inflections the rest of us can't you know, excuse me, excuse, and you're like, excuse me, what are they saying? But it can be, it can be a, 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 
a blink of an eye. It can be the, the tiny bit of tone. It could be your body language at a moment. They're going to pick up on it. And so you almost need to train yourself in what I call sort of a hostage negotiator voice, which is very calm, very tempered, very consistent. But some of them will also take umbrage at that. And I, I've had many oh, of my do, clients, of when they go back and they start dealing with the narcissist with the tools I've given them saying, oh, so you're better than me now? And it's interesting that they go there because they realize now they're being outplayed. And right. so that's what's happening And that's happening when you just too. say, I don't think yeah. that I'm better mm -hmm. than you. You just, yeah. you yeah. just mm -hmm. respond. And, and the way I um, usually phrase it is, you just look at it as if you're looking at a two-year-old having mm -hmm. a temper tantrum mm -hmm. on the floor. You don't mm -hmm. feel like going down there and having a temper tantrum right, with right, them. Right. You're just observing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you're just kind of just observing mm -hmm. the situation. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> be prepared that they're going to um, obstruct at every, at every possible angle. So they're, they're not going to give you the discovery that you ask for. Yep. They're going to make you work for every single bank mm -hmm. statement, every single piece of information. Um, anything that they think that you want, mm -hmm. that's what you're not going to get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going back to the manipulate the manipulator, mm -hmm. um, you just have to act like the thing that means the most to you, you don't care about the thing that, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. when you're putting mm -hmm. together your entire global package of what you want, um, be, you know, decide what you want, then ask for a hell of a lot more than that, mm -hmm. and be prepared for what mm -hmm. you're going to yeah give away. Yep. And then when you give that away, act like it was the worst possible thing, like you're cutting off your mm -hmm. arm. Yes, yes, um, yes, yes, yes. You know, yes. if you think you're going to get the satisfaction that the person knows that you got what you wanted yep. and you're never going to settle, it's never going to happen. Well, and one of the best tales I have about this, I remember working a malignant narcissistic father, you know, really, really beaten down mother. They had many children and um, it was a horrific, horrific divorce. And um, I remember there was that time I said, just, you know, she, she had texted me and she said, listen, here's the deal. And it was basically, the long story short was, she wanted the children on a particular weekend, very much because of a family event. It was supposed to be her weekend, but he'd, he had sort of browbeaten her into, you know, dividing the weekend up in an odd way that would throw, up, throw off this family event. And I said to her, and so he insisted, no, I'm entitled to this time until this time, rah, 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 bully, 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 entitled, entitled, entitled. And I said to her, what you've got to do is text him and say, wonderful this works out so great for me because my girlfriends are having like this big party and we're all going out to this new wine bar so the timing is great I'm so glad you have a good weekend five minutes yeah <laughs> five minutes I, I can't I can't take them what are you trying, trying to take advantage of me and and I was like and then she got the kids and she had a yeah. wonderful family event so yeah. you have got to there's again like I said Narcissistic people are like knock-knock jokes. They, 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 they're silly, and you laugh at them kind of silly, but they're ridiculous. And it's so, it was so easy to see what he was trying to do, but she, she knew his Achilles heel. He couldn't stand the idea that she was ever having fun. Yeah. I said, so let him think that what him having the kids means she's going to have fun, done. Brilliant. And, then she, and she's used that gambit more than yeah. once. And believe it or not, homie never figured it out. So it yeah. worked out great. <laughs> well, so, and another thing you could do is like, you know, massage their ego and say, oh, you know, mm -hmm. My family will, will realize what a great dad you mm -hmm. are. Everybody thinks so highly of you. And, and, you know, so, you know, if you massage that ego a little mm -hmm. bit and they're, they're doing it because now they're going to get credit for it yep. somehow mm -hmm. by looking mm -hmm. like amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's another way yeah, that absolutely. you could potentially get it done absolutely. too. You, another thing you've spoken about is this idea of entitlement and using the court system as their sort of their, almost like their personal hammer mm -hmm. to punish other people. Yeah. So... They'll file any motion they possibly can dream up. Mm. So the the you know it's it actually takes a lot more courage to sit down and have a real conversation with a person. Of course, because then you actually have to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You actually you know have to be prepared to give up stuff mm -hmm. and and things like that. So, but what narcissists will do is they'll use the system as a sword. Mm -hmm. So every possible motion they can dream up. The minute your discovery is one day late, they're filing a motion to compel. Um, they're filing um, uh, custody mm -hmm. evaluations. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. filing uh, vocational evaluations. Mm -hmm. They're they're going to file a motion for exclusive occupancy. They're going to uh, threaten to depose everyone at your office. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. They're going mm -hmm. to um, threaten to yeah. bring your parents into court. Yes. To yes. you know your, your elderly mother who's on yeah. oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. I'm deposing her. Mm -hmm. um, you know no no. Nothing is left untouched, no, un, you know, and, and there's no 
um, there's no, there's no um, thing that I'm not going to go. Mm -hmm. There's no bar that's mm -hmm. so low that I won't cross mm -hmm, or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so they, they're sort of equal opportunity harassers at that point. And right. I think a lot of people get almost bowled over in the shock of it all. Right. Of like, you're, you're deposing who you're sending this. I, I remember even getting once caught in the crosshairs of a very, very toxic divorce. And watching the ex, like he, or the now, now ex, literally he was sending subpoenas. He was having people served all over town. And he sadly was an attorney too. So like, and he had limitless money. So he was subpoenaing people all over Los Angeles, all over the country. You know, and it was, you know, to me it was a grotesque, First of all, I was like, what attorney was willing to sign up to represent oh, this mess? Don't take the money. You know? Believe me. So, I mean, you can always find somebody to take was, the money. I mean, my dad used to say the percentage of idiots per population <laughs> is the same wherever you go. So, so you'll always find a lawyer that will take the money. Yep. Um, and, 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 you know, people will say, well, how can their lawyer believe them? How can they be saying this stuff? How, why isn't their lawyer mm -hmm. telling them? Well, their lawyer is a paid mouthpiece. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. that's what they're, they're there mm -hmm. to do. I mm -hmm. mean, there's, there's lawyers who have ethics and, mm -hmm. and who aren't willing to go certain places, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of lawyers that mm -hmm. don't have that. So, you know, <clears> one <throat> of the things you had talked about, and I think this is one that often gets lost, is having an attorney who gets narcissism. I know when people come to me and say, da da da, divorce, legal question, I'm like, not my area, but you need to make sure your attorney gets this. They've gone so far, my wise clients have put me on the phone with their attorney. And I'm like, do you get this? Mm -hmm. And then I'll have the client in the room with me so we can lock eyes and I'll usually say, let this attorney go. They don't get it. And so I will, I will grill the attorney to make sure they actually understand what this personality pattern is. Mm -hmm. And if they don't seem to be getting it, like it's just not gonna work. So what kinds of questions would you advise someone, you're an attorney, to ask an attorney to see, do they get this? Uh, well, I, I think, it Questions you can ask, yeah, are how many people have you dealt with mm -hmm. that have narcissism or how many people have you represented mm -hmm. or, you know, mm -hmm. and what has been the outcomes and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can ask those kinds of questions. But I think more so it's, it's going to be a gut feeling and it's going to be feel. Like if you are telling the person what your experience has been, how you, mm -hmm. you know, how this person has victimized you, how they act, mm -hmm. even if they don't use the word narcissism, mm -hmm although a lot of people do nowadays, but mm -hmm. e even so, even if the person just says, these are the types mm -hmm. of things that they're doing, you know, it should tip the attorney off as to the type of personality okay. that they're dealing mm -hmm. with. And okay, these are the things that we're going to need to do. And, you know, and I talk about having a strategy, creating leverage, mm -hmm. being, you know, anticipating the, I use the, the term slay. So mm -hmm. you, know, you want to slay your negotiation. Mm -hmm. So strategy, leverage, anticipate, meaning you need to always mm -hmm. be at least mm -hmm. two steps ahead of mm -hmm. what the narcissist is, mm -hmm. is, and anticipating what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And then focusing on you is, is the mm -hmm. why. You know, your mindset, not being a victim, you know, get out of that victim mentality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as long as you say he makes me feel like, yeah. um, you know, uh, this is what's being done to me. I can never get what I want. Mm -hmm. um, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Or this person is uh, always charms everyone. Mm -hmm. Is smarter than everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're still you're still nipping the Kool Aid then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So um, just talking to mm -hmm. the, that attorney and make sure you have an attorney that you feel like you have mm -hmm. a rapport with because. Mm -hmm you have to put your entire life in this person's hands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I tell people all the time, if you don't think that I'm the one for you, there are plenty of other yeah. fish in the That's sea right. and, and I've say got the same plenty thing. to do. And I tell so. people, clients the same exact thing. Yeah, so. But you, I mean, and in this, as you know, as we're coming sort of the end of our time, there's two last things that I, I, I really want to make sure people hear. You've been talking about leverage. You mm -hmm. use that word a lot, mm -hmm. especially in this issue of negotiating with a yeah. narcissist and particularly in a divorce. Yeah. What does that look like? What does that really mean? What does that look like? So leverage to me is in, in the context of negotiating mm -hmm. with a narcissist is the motivation, the incentive that you're going to give that that narcissist to come to the table and mm -hmm. have a conversation mm -hmm. with you mm -hmm. it, and, you know, figuring out what their pain points are, figuring out what their motivation is. Mm -hmm. Is it looking as good as possible? Is mm -hmm. it saving their money? Is it what what's their real motivation mm -hmm. in all of this? Mm -hmm. Is it not letting the world know that they have herpes because they're a, a doctor in the community? Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. I've had mm-hmm. that situation. What what's going to be the thing that's going to motivate them to come to the table? Mm-hmm. And it may be stuff that you gather along the way. It may be a text message here. It may be an inconsistency there. It may mm-hmm. be a lie that they told under deposition, and now you have proof that it was a lie. Mm-hmm. Things like that. I mean, it, okay. it may be, you know, you're building a wall around this person to the extent that by the time you get to actually have a conversation about how to resolve the case, uh-huh. they feel completely boxed in. And one thing that you should know is that the narcissist acts the worst right before they're ready to give in. Oh, absolutely. Uh, no, that, that, that's, you know, and I try to reassure my clients on that. Now, obviously, in, in this idea of creating leverage, that's something that typically happens with an attorney. When I work with my clients, I talk about something called their true north. Mm-hmm. And I say, your true north can be anything. For some people, their true north is literally their freedom. For some people, their true north is time with their children. Mm-hmm. For other people, you know, their, their true north is getting an apology. Like, it, it's going to be different depending on the person. And for us, a lot of the work is around that because what it does is it takes some of the the wind out of the sails of how toxic this experience is. I said, once you can focus on that fixed point on the horizon or in the sky, then you know what you're navigating to. And it makes all of this make sense. We know that suffering can be endurable if you can find meaning and purpose in it. And say, you know what? I am, I am enduring this. I am doing these things, gaining leverage, working with my attorney. But my true north is my kids. And like, listen, narcissistic divorces always do a number on kids. I'm not even going to let anyone retain the naive assumption that this divorce is, does not do a number on kids. Well, I mean, even having a narcissistic parent does a number It does a number on a kid. Whether you, exactly. So either way, your poor kid is already facing a difficult journey. Right. And that's something I, I take on in my, on my content and what happens, those different pathways. But it's a, you know, this, this is a, people say, you know what, I know this experience is going to do a number on my kids. So I'm really focused on making this as non-contentious as possible, yes, getting the leverage, but also creating as calm and serene a space for these kids in the midst of the storm for them to to stay sane. So it's like that balancing act between what I'm doing in my office and what Rebecca's doing in her office to get you to that sane ending for you and whoever else is being affected by this process. And I just want to make one last Mm -hmm. point before we wrap up here, and that is that, and I've made this point before, but it's worth repeating, and that is that just because you want leverage doesn't mean that 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 means you're a fighter that that means you're being mm-hmm, difficult mm-hmm. that that means you're ramping it up or whatever mm-hmm. the the paradox is that if you don't want to fight if you want the case to settle amicably you have to have leverage against the Bingo. narcissist yeah. or you won't be able to to, to 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 do that and i think that's 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 such an important po- point and i'm really gra- glad rebecca made that point because this idea that seeking out leverage is not contentious. It may be the only path to something that even resembles an amicable ending to this. So I think that that's, it's finding that balance. Again, anyone who's been through one of these relationships has been through a lot of contention for a long time. It's a slow soul death to be in one of these relationships. Mm So, you know, um, there is, again, we could talk probably for hours about this idea of, of, um, of, this, about this idea of how to litigate with a narcissist. Apparently the punchline to this joke is, it's not easy. Yeah. And anyone could, would know that if they've even gotten into one argument with a narcissistic individual. So any parting words? Uh, just, you know, be ready for the fight of your life, mm-hmm. but just, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. be patient and persevere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's it. And again, that's where it always comes back to my central tenets, realistic expectations, radical acceptance. Once you get there and you have to remind yourself that it becomes daily practice multiple times a day, write it it on the landing screen of your phone if you need to, but that, okay, he's behaving foolishly, she's behaving erratically, of course she is. And the sun rose in the east this morning. Everything's exactly as it should be. Now, you're dealing with a narcissist in a court setting, and you're feeling like they just always get their way. I've dealt with it so many times where people will come into my office, even in the beginning of a case, and say, 
I think that they're going to fool everyone because the person who's the narcissist is going to win, is going to uh, get everybody to believe that they're wonderful and I'm horrible. And, and narcissists do start their smear campaigns in that, in, in that discard phase. And if you want to know more about what the signs are of a smear campaign, definitely check out my video on signs of a narcissist smear campaign. But once that smear, smear campaign starts, they, they're, they're in this mode of trying to make sure that you're the one that looks bad and they're the one that looks good. So they're going to be kind of love bombing everybody in the system, including the judges, including your, the, you know, their lawyer, your lawyer even. And, and, and if there's a, a custody evaluator involved, you know, they're gonna be love bombing that person. And they're going to be trying to make you look like you're the bad one. So they may be filing bogus motions. They may be calling you an abuser, you know, really horrible things. I've seen, you know, really good parents be the victim of the other pa parent saying that parent is an abuser or that parent is unfit or that parent is a drug addict or something like that. And you're sitting there thinking, I'm like having coffee in my house. I don't really know. But uh, the, the, they start that. And they, they not only say it to people sometimes, they actually even put it in pleadings. You know, you'll actually see a motion or something that is filled with lies. And you think, how are they getting away with this? How are they getting away with this? I can't tell you how many clients I've, I've heard say to me, how are they getting away with this? Well, let me just first address that. The one thing that you have to remember is that the only person who has any power to order somebody to do something is the judge, no one else. You know, I actually had a client say to me, you've done nothing to control him and his behavior. And I, re I remember thinking, what would I do other than file motions? Because that's the power that your, your lawyer has, is to file something with the court. But remember, when something is filed with the court, it just sits there in the clerk's file, doesn't do anything until a hearing is actually had. Because those filings are, for the most part, not evidence that can be accepted into the court system, actually in a hearing setting. So once that motion is filed, then you can go in front of a judge. And that's how you can start exposing the narcissist in court. How do you do it? You do it by not actually saying the person is a narcissist. Don't use the word narcissist in court. I actually have a whole video on that. Make sure you check that out on whether you can even use the word narcissist in court. But what you're going to do is you're going to actually have um, other ways that you can expose this narcissist for their behavior. And you do that very systematically. There's no magic wand. There's no go buy this thing and that's going to be the thing uh, other than the slay program because the slay program will show you how to do that. But what you're going to be doing is creating documentation and exhibits that actually systematically show that that person is a bad person. And you want to do it in light of the statutes, in light of something that the judge is going to care about. Because remember, the judge has to apply the law. That's the judge's job. So what a judge will do is they'll listen to that side, they'll listen to this side, but remember, they just get a little teeny snapshot. You might have been dealing with this person for 15 or 20 years. You get like a couple of hours in front of a judge to expose this person. So you wanna make sure it's good. You wanna make sure that it packs a punch. So you're gonna create summaries, for example, of when the person lied, and then have all your supporting documentation attached to it, or create summaries of when they um, didn't pick up the kids, or didn't show up on time, or 
but we're bad mouthed you, you know, something like that. Because, but you're going to do it in in light of the statute. So if the stat, if the best interest of the child statute says that parents are supposed to foster a close and continuing relationship between the children and the other parent, and you've got tons of text messages where. They're saying to the the kids that you know the other parent is a, an alcoholic or a, you know neglectful, doesn't want you or something like that. Those become wonderful trial exhibits. So you know you're actually giving the judge something that they can hold on to, that they can use when they're applying that law, that actually gives you the results that you actually want. Um, just going in and saying. That person is a narcissist, isn't going to get you anywhere. So that's not how you expose them. You expose them by actually doing your homework, which a lot of that, I have a 45 page workbook in the SLAY program, so you should definitely check that out. But that, that's how you're ultimately going to expose them by systematically using the information that you have and putting it together in light of the statutes that the judge is actually going to care about. That's how you will expose them. And if you are so ready to expose that narcissist in court, give me it. Expose the truth in the comments. So remember that narcissists feed off of narcissistic supply. And one of the things that they're going to do is, um, is try to get all the judges and everybody to love them. So. What you, what you want to do is create leverage by figuring out which person in the system they're going to um, respect the most, which is probably the judge, and then create leverage, which is going to um, potentially threaten to expose them for who they are. So, and, and if you want to more, know more about leverage, definitely check out my video on creating leverage. But that's going to be one of the whole keys to this whole thing. That's the L in my SLAY program. So S, S is strategy and L is leverage. So you, you, you want to create this leverage that's going to threaten to expose them and that way um, they potentially might even settle. And I know a lot of people think, oh, nobody ever settles with a narcissist. You can never get them to settle. But that is so not true. If you threaten a supply source that's more important for them to keep than the supply that they get from jerking you around in the system, you will be able to resolve your case. So I'm going to give you five ways to make sure that you beat a narcissist in court. So you're going to want to make sure you stay till the end. You're going to want to make sure that you save this video. You're going to want to make sure you share it out. You're going to want to make sure that you go ahead and watch it over and over again, because I'm going to give you all the ways to make sure that you beat a narcissist in court. Okay. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to remember the acronym, knock them dead. All right. So D E A D D. So two D's. But D E A D D, knock them dead. So the first D stands for document everything. And I mean everything. You know, you're going to want to journal everything. You're want to, going to want to document everything. In my slave program, I actually have 12 different things that you're going to want to be documenting, but you're going to want to document everything with regard to finances, to your children, if you have children, anything that they do that seems out of the ordinary. I know it's a pain, but you know, if you have a notes app or something, just note it because you're not going to remember. But you know, even if it's crazy, oh, I don't know if I should write that down, but you know, you just never know. And there's many different ways that these things come into play. So you will want to make sure that you document everything, whether it's a business case or a family law case, or it's against a business partner. Maybe it's a, a case against an employer or something like that. It always is something that you're going to need to be doing is documenting. Whether it's a timeline form, you end up needing it for the statutes to prove different elements of a statute you definitely need documentation. I also have a podcast where I ended up interviewing one of the people who used my Slay for Biz program, Sharon Scott. I highly recommend that you check that out because she talked about how she used my program and it really helped her a lot. So definitely document everything. The next thing is 
the E, emotions. Keep them in check. You're definitely going to want to keep your emotions in check. There's so many different reasons that you want to keep your emotions in check. I mean, for one thing is that they want to trigger you constantly. They love to see you squirm. So they get supply from it. And you really don't want to give them narcissistic supply, obviously, because that's no fun. I mean, they just get the satisfaction of seeing you go crazy, right? I mean, why do you want to do that? But then the next thing is that they use your reaction against you. They go, look, there's the crazy one. There's the one that's the problem. And they will use that against you in a number of ways. They use the emails against you, the texts against you. They may even be videotaping against you. They use the witnesses against you, whatever it is. So definitely keep your emotions in check. They use it for custody, so many different things. So definitely E, keep your emotions in check. And it doesn't help you when you're negotiating either if you're all over the place when it comes to settlements, because then you end up settling for things that you regret two months down the road, three months down the road. You're like, oh, I didn't want to settle for that. Because a lot of times you're like, oh, I just, I just ended up settling for that because I just wanted it to be done. I just wanted it to be over with, or maybe you were just feeling pressured, you know, really try to keep your emotions in check. And by the way, if you're really, really struggling with that, because a lot of times when you're, you've been dealing with a narcissist for a long period of time, you, you are in a trauma state, especially PTSD. Sometimes I do have a partnership with BetterHelp. You can go to betterhelp.com forward slash Rebecca Zung. I do receive commissions on that. It doesn't cost you any more. We have a partnership with them because I wanted to have a partnership with a service that we could trust, that we could recommend. If you are struggling, go to betterhelp.com forward slash Rebecca Zung so that you can get the help and support that you need if you're having trouble with your emotions and you're having trouble with trauma. So that's the E. The next one is always wear the white hat. That's the A, always wear the white hat. And what do I mean by that? I mean by that in that you want to be the one if you end up in front of the judge, which that's what this is about. You want to be the one where the judge is like, hey, this is the person that obviously is the good one. Let the narcissist be the one who's the one who's badly behaving. A lot of times it's so easy to fall into, hey, they're behaving badly. They're doing things wrong. They did it too. I can do it too. What happens though is then you have a situation where the judge is just like seeing like two kids that are fighting. So for those of you who are, who are out there watching, who have children and, and you have more than one, what happens is it, they just are like, oh, both of you just stop it. You know, they don't see that, oh, well, they started it or they're worse. They just see two people who just are fighting. So you want to be the one who's consistently not being in the mud with the other one. Because if you are the one who's what I call always wearing the white hat, who's not engaging, who didn't respond, who didn't get into it, and the other one is always the one who's constantly the badly behaved one, then it makes it really, really obvious who is the the bad one. And, and it's kind of hand in hand with keeping your emotions in check, but it's even one step much, much further than that. You really, really want to be the one who's just always behaving, always doing the right thing. So just kind of imagine that the judge is sort of walking around with you and watching every single thing that you're doing. Always wear the white hat. That's the A. All right. So the next one is don't go anywhere alone. That's the D, the first D in knock them dead. And we're going through all the elements of what to do to beat a narcissist in court. So, you know, this is because if they're going to say you followed them, you, you did this, you did that, they lie all the time. So they're constantly going to be saying that you were menacing, 
that you were threatening, that you did this with the kids or that you touch somebody inappropriately or whatever it is that they make up constantly. And, and then you end up having to defend against these ridiculous claims. So you want to make sure that you have people around as much as you possibly can. If you have children, for example, have your exchanges for custody at daycares, at schools, you know, at shopping plazas or places where people are around because you just don't want situations where they can make things up about what's going on. And in that same vein, by the way, you're going to want to make sure that even depositions are videotaped if possible. And I have actually a whole video on how to be a narcissist in mediation. I talk about that in there and you should definitely check out that video as well, because a lot of you who are trying to beat a narcissist in court are also mediating with a narcissist and you should definitely check out that video as well. And I also do have a whole video where I interview Judge Lynn Toller. You guys should definitely check out that video too. She was the judge on divorce court for 17 years and her video interview was very, very highly fascinating. So definitely check that out too. And if you guys are so ready to knock them dead, put knock them dead in the comments because I'm so ready to help you knock them dead. And if you've been following along with how to beat a narcissist in court and you've been following along with my acronym, you know, there's one more D. The last D is decoys. It stands for decoys. And what I mean by decoys is you really do not want to give them your best offer or give them any of your best evidence or show them any of your cards or show them any of your hands until you're ready to unveil it in court or when you're ready. I mean, a lot of times while you're standing on the courthouse steps or even at lunch during the trial, they want to settle they're ready to have settlement talks or even maybe the eve before trial or a couple of days before they're ready to have some settlement talks at that point or something and you might be ready at that point as well but you've got to have your strategy your leverage have anticipated your focus on you your position that being on the offensive my whole slay methodology at that point you do not give them your best offer you do not show your best evidence you decoy the whole thing until you are so ready to go basically the way i look at it is you're building an invisible fence around them until you turn on the lights and they realize, oh my God, I'm totally pinned in. At that point, they have no choice but to resolve the issue with you or resolve the issues with you. So you're appearing weak, you're feigning ignorance, you, you know, oh, I, I don't know, I have no idea. Let them think that they're winning let them go all crazy on you. Allow them to go off. A lot of times that's good for you. It's hard. I know because it's, you don't want them to get away with anything a lot of times during the case, but sometimes if you have an ongoing case, it's good to let them screw up because those little battles that show that they're screwing up help you to demonstrate to the judge who they actually are. So let them do that, you know, because then you can show patterns that they aren't doing what they're supposed to do, show patterns that they're liars, show patterns that they are bad parents or terrible with money or whatever it is that you need to show it actually ends up helping you in the end or that they have anger issues or whatever it is so that definitely helps you sometimes it's it's really really good to 
feign that you're weak, feign that you're ignorant. A lot of times, by the way, you, you can pretend like there's a particular thing that you really, really want, and it's not the thing that you really, really want, because then, you know, they go after that, you know, because they're going to go after the thing that they think that you really, really want, right? So let them go after that particular thing. So I wanted to actually take you through those five stages, you know, the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross stages of grief and how they actually play out during a divorce, especially during a divorce with a narcissist, during the five stages of a divorce with a narcissist in particular. Okay. So what do the five stages of a divorce with a narcissist look like? Number one is denial. So when you are dealing with a divorce from a narcissist, you are dealing with denial. First of all, you deal with the fear, that fear of what's going to happen, that catastrophe of what's going to happen. Because when you are dealing with a divorce from a narcissist, you know what's coming. You know that down the pike, they're going to turn against you. You know you're going to become public enemy number one. You know that potentially going to expose you and, and try to turn the world against you and all of those things, right? And so you know that potentially emotionally, physically, spiritually, all of those things, it's going to be pure hell. And, you know, what's going to happen to you? What's going to happen to your children? What's going to happen to you financially? And you're imagining all the worst possible things. And so maybe you are in denial at, at the beginning about all of it because you just don't even want to think about it. So you kind of deny that this is where your relationship is. You think maybe it's not so bad, or maybe I can live with this, or maybe it's not so bad all the time, or maybe this person can change. So you're kind of in denial about the relationship being as bad as you think that it is, right? So that's probably the first stage of divorce. And then the second stage is that anger where you think, why are you like this? And why do you have to be so horrible? And why couldn't you just change? And why did you have to mess things up? Why did you have to cheat? And how did, could you have stripped so much of my life away? And why did I waste my life on you? And you're just so angry at this person for maybe messing up your children's lives, just everything. Maybe you're resentful about the fact that they didn't make more money or that they wasted money on things. At this stage where you just maybe feel entitled, maybe you just feel like they need to pay for everything that they've done to you. And I'm telling you, a lot of people, they get stuck in this stage for a very long time. A lot of people never get out of this stage. I think a lot of times people feel like if they forgive or if they move on or if they get out of this stage, like somehow the narcissist got away with it in some way. Like if they let it go, then they got away with it somehow. And that's just not the case. I mean, you need to move on for you. This is not about them. This is about you not living with the venom, not living with the poison, not living with that toxicity within you. That's number two. This is that anger stage that people live in for a very long time. And let me tell you, there's a big difference between wanting what's equitable and what's allowed under the law and wanting to apply the law and being fine with that, allowing that to happen and not allowing guilt to be part of that, not allowing being afraid to be part of that, not allowing emotion to be part of that, just allowing the law to be applied without anything else to be part of that. 
Okay, so that's the second part. That's anger. The next one is bargaining. And bargaining is where you might go back into, well, you know, this is where it can be sort of dangerous because this is where your narcissist, especially when you're divorcing a narcissist, your narcissist might start getting nice again. You know, they might start hoovering. And so you might start getting weak again too. Might You might start going, well, you know, maybe this might work out or maybe it's not going to be so bad, or maybe we might be able to be friends or maybe we might be able to somehow, some way, either get back together or maybe we can be amicable or maybe I can get them to see my value or maybe if I just give in on certain points, they'll start to give in for me. And this is a trap I see people often fall into, especially in negotiating with narcissists. Sometimes people think, well, if I give a lot on the front end, they'll see how great I'm being and they'll also give in. That definitely is never the case, by the way, ever. They just take and then it just goes into the ether and they'll just they'll be like, yeah, and your point is what? That never helps you in any way, by the way. And they don't acknowledge you. They don't see your value. I mean, that doesn't help you. And so that you go through this bargaining stage. And, and a lot of times that whole re honeymoon phase is often met with rejection. You know, you try to get them to see your side or whatever, and it doesn't work out. And then it ends up feeling worse and you end up feeling even worse than you did before. It's almost like you've been rejected again. And so it ends up where you feel even more lonely or more sad or something like that. The one thing I do want to say is I have a couple of videos. One is on self-care when you're coping with the narcissist. I would definitely check that out. The other one is I have a video on self-care when coping with a narcissist. That's an interview that I did with Amy Newmark, who's the president of the Chicken Soup for the Soul entities. And she had done a book on it, on self-care. And I would definitely highly recommend that interview as well. Great, great stuff. Check out both of those videos on taking care of yourself and making sure that you are doing what you need to, to take care of yourself. And I want you to put that in the comments right now that I take care of myself. Put that in the comments right now. I take care of myself. Just to remind yourself that you do that and you will do that throughout this process because it is so hard sometimes to remember to do that, especially during this difficult time. So after you've gone through denial, anger, and bargaining, now you go into depression. And this is one of the hardest ones because you've gone through denial, anger, and bargaining. In some ways, they're like easier, even though they're difficult to go through, they're easier than the depression, because the depression is the lowest point, honestly. This is where the divorce is probably over and you just are feeling lonely, you're feeling sad, you're probably beating yourself up. You, there's a lot of the Monday morning quarterbacking of, did I waste my life? Did the person ever love me? Did I give up too much in the divorce? I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have signed that. Maybe I had a terrible lawyer. That other person had a better lawyer than I did. I spent too much money on the divorce. I, I gave up too much time sharing. You know, there's always this whole thing about I should have left 10 years earlier. I never should have married the person. There's all this regret and la, 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 la stuff going on. Don't go down that rabbit hole. You cannot do anything about the past. It's not going to give you any sense of satisfaction. It's not going to go anywhere but down. That level of vibration is horrible for you. And don't even go being around people who are going to 
serve that kind of conversation because it's not going to help you. If they're saying, oh, you know, I saw your ex and they're with this other person and they're off having this great life, that's not going to help you either. What's going to help you is you starting to create your new life, starting to create new memories and all that sort of thing. Because that first year where it's a year of firsts, where it's different, you know, it's the first holiday where it's something different each time, or you used to always do Sunday brunches and now you don't anymore or whatever. And you're just having to create your own, maybe new set of friends or, or whatever. It's difficult. And so starting to create your own new life, your own new future, where you feel whole and complete on your own is going to be absolutely critical. Developing your own set of interests, your own set of friends, join a book club or join a runner's club or start something where you have cult, you're cultivating your own life where you start to feel whole and complete, join a meditation group or something like that, where you start to do things for your own peace of mind, where you start to feel whole and complete on your own, that will do wonders for you. Really making sure that you have your own support system in place is going to be absolutely critical. And then the next level, that's going to lead into the acceptance. You'll know you're into that acceptance phase when you can see your ex and not feel any emotion about it other than, oh, there is my ex. Hello, goodbye, whatever. I don't feel anything around you other than there's my ex. And you've now pursued your own life. You now have your own life. And Your ex has his or her own new life and everybody has gone their own ways and it's all fine, well, and good. And you need to create that space for yourself. Those are the five stages of divorce with a narcissist. And that's the most important thing. When you can get through that, when you can get to that level of acceptance, that is where you know that you have moved on that you've gone all the way through, that you have moved through all five stages and you have become who you really are supposed to be. You know, your soul knows that you were born for more. Your soul knows that you were meant for more. Okay, so before we dive into what to do about that narcissist in a divorce, let me just give you a few highlights of the kinds of tricks and manipulations that they try to pull in a divorce. And believe me, I have seen it all. I've represented them and I've had them on the other side many, many times. So let me tell you the kinds of patterns. They actually all try to pull the same sort of tricks. So let me tell you the kinds of things that they do. Okay, the number one thing that they try to do is win at all costs. They are going to try to make you look as bad as possible, no matter how ridiculous it seems, they're going to twist everything. And that's why I tell you to put everything in writing. We're going to talk about more of that in a minute. But everything you say, do, or or the way you breathe is going to be try to twist it and manipulate it and in whatever way possible so that they look good and you look bad because they're gonna try to win at all costs. So here is number two, the things that they do. And here's the crazy part, because despite what I just said about them going to try to win at all costs, winning is actually not what they wanna do. What they want to do is get the best of you. That's actually what they want to do. It's going to look like they're winning at all, trying to win at all costs, but what they're actually trying to do is manipulate you at all costs. So just remember that now that you are stepping out of their world, you don't have any more value for them. Because for a narcissist, people 
only have value to the extent that they can use them for their own pot potential gain. So now that you're stepping out of that and you have no more potential gain for them, now the only goal is just to manipulate you and make your life miserable. Number three thing they try to do is use the court system as their sword. So they're going to file as many motions as possible, litigate as much as possible, make you spend as much money as possible, and make your life miserable by dragging you through the court system. Unfortunately, that's number three. Number four thing they try to do in a divorce is actually kind of related to number three, but it's, it's its own separate category, and that is they try to obstruct you from everything. So they're not, not gonna provide the discovery that they're supposed to. They're just gonna make you work for everything. And so as part of that, you're gonna end up having to file motions to compel, and you're, again, you're gonna have to be uh, running up the fees and that sort of thing. And they'll have court orders and they're not gonna obey them and you're gonna be sitting there going, how in the heck can he or she get away with this? Well, the bottom line is that the only person who has any power over anyone is the judge. So they get away with it until you get back in front of a judge and tell them what they've been doing. So that's number four, obstruction. If this sounds familiar to you, give me an amen in the comments. Okay, now that I've scared the crap out of you, I'm gonna tell you what to do about it. Number one, you've got to have a clear strategy. It's better be crystal clear and it better be strong and it better be powerful. You better to be ready to go on the offensive and have your leverage ready. You better do your research, do your homework, have everything you need to incentivize that other side to want to come to a resolution with you. Even if you say, I don't want to fight, I want it to be amicable, great. But if you've got a narcissist on the other side, they don't feel the same way, all right? So if you want them to come to that nice, easy conclusion, then you're gonna have to incentivize them to do that. And the only way you can do that is by getting leverage. I have a video on how to negotiate with a narcissist specifically. You're gonna definitely wanna check that out and I will drop a link to that below. Okay, number two, you're gonna to wanna to pick a really strong lawyer, and you're gonna to wanna to pick a lawyer that knows what he or she is doing. Make sure that they know what type of person that they're gonna be dealing with so that they can help you develop that strategy that I talked about in step number one. And related to this step number two, by the way, is to make sure you pick a lawyer that you're really gonna trust and then trust that lawyer. Because what your narcissist soon to be ex is going to do is try to get you to distrust your lawyer. That person is gonna say your lawyer's only out for whatever, or only money, or, or, or to break us up, or whatever it is. But you know, if you are dealing with a narcissist, that that person is probably a pathological liar. And so why would they start telling the truth now? So the, the only reason they want your lawyer out of the picture is because then they can drive that wedge in there and get control back over you again. So once you pick a lawyer that you really like and you know you can trust, listen to him or her, okay? Okay, number three thing that you can do is document, document, document. Everything in writing, you know, he or she is going to say to you, oh, let's just meet at Starbucks. Let's just have a conversation. We don't need all this stuff. You know, so that's the kind of thing they're gonna do. And then every single thing you say will have been ended up being twisted. And, and, and you're gonna be gaslighted and they're gonna be saying, oh no, we had this conversation and you agreed to X, Y, Z, or they're gonna send you an email afterwards saying, Oh, and we agreed to X, Y, and Z, and you know you never had that conversation, right? So that's what they're gonna do. Make sure everything's in writing as absolutely much as possible because they're going to try to manipulate you anyway, but at least you can try to minimize it. And that's what we're talking about here. You're not gonna be able to change the other person. The other person is who they are, but you can do things to try to protect yourself and be feeling like you're on the offen offensive rather than on the defensive the whole time. Okay, and number four thing that you can do is keep your cool. You're gonna wanna keep your emotions in check. It's one of my six steps of winning in any negotiation, and I'll go ahead and put a link to that video as well. But you're definitely gonna wanna keep your emotions in check because 
that's what they want. They want you to lose your cool. They want to get under your skin. And as soon as you allow them to do that, now they're already winning again. Now, now it's working, whatever manipulation it is that they're trying to pull on you. So keep your cool, keep your emotions in check, and uh, don't let them get the best of you. Her lawyer is wanting mediation, but I don't want to give in away any more. What are your thoughts? So my thoughts are this. When you go to a mediation with a narcissist, yeah, and you can settle a case in mediation with a narcissist, by the way. A lot of people say don't bother mediation or don't bother trying to settle a case with a narcissist. It never works. And every time I see that, I think, no, that's not true. I've had many, many narcissists settle in mediation. But the key is that when you go to mediation with a narcissist, you can't just walk in and think you're going to talk it through and resolve differences because there's one key element that's missing when you're dealing with a narcissist in mediation. And that is they don't actually really want to settle the case because they get narcissistic supply from jerking you around. So how do you get them to settle a case in mediation? Well, you have to have a super strong strategy and you have to have created enough leverage that when you get to that mediation, they feel motivated and squeezed and incentivized into settling the case. That's what I teach people how to do with my slay system and my slay program. Strategy, leverage, anticipate what the narcissist is going to do and focus on your case and you and creating an offensive position. So, but leverage is really, really key. So the mistake that people make a lot of times when they go into a mediation with a narcissist is that they think that they're dealing with, you know, a, a, a reasonable person or you just think, oh, it's perfunctory. The court's making me do it. So let's just get this over with. And hopefully the mediator will be able to help. And hopefully the lawyers will be able to help. And, and it just ends up being a really super expensive conversation that doesn't really get you anywhere. So yes, you should mediate. And here's why. Because when you go to mediation, if you get them to set, sign a settlement agreement in mediation, then the case is done. If you go to court and you go before a judge and the judge hands down a decision, then that decision is appealable. So you could win 100% of everything that you want in court and still not be done because they can appeal that. And even worse, they can file a motion to stay the orders, meaning Whatever you want in that final judgment is just going to be held in limbo and you're not going to get to enjoy the fruits of that until after the appeal is done. Appeals take a long time and they're very expensive. Now, oftentimes appeals aren't um, successful. Most of the time, people who appeal don't prevail. I mean, it's like a 15% a win rate or something if you're appealing, but even so, you're still dealing with this person. So it is definitely better to try to get them to sign an agreement. But don't go back and forth with between your attorneys to try to get them to sign an agreement. You definitely want them to sign in mediation when all these people are around them, the mediator, the, the, the other lawyers. Because one of the things about narcissists is that they desperately do not want to look bad in front of people that they respect and especially the judge. So if you get to mediation and you've got all your leverage ready to go and, and all of these bits of information that they're realizing is going to come out if they end up in front of a judge or that they're, they're, they might end up with a bad result or something like that, that's how you squeeze them into settling a case at mediation. So I do recommend that you try to mediate again. And um, PR, I just, it's kind of a long way of answering your question, but I thought it was a really good one and a great opportunity for me to tell you why I think mediation is a good idea 
even if you're dealing with a narcissist and sometimes, especially if you're dealing with a narcissist, because that's where your leverage is going to be the best. Um, because all narcissists are driven by supply and all, and a big piece of that supply is how they look in front of people. So looking bad in front of a judge or maybe having information come out about them that's public, that they don't want to um, come out about them um, is a really, really nice form of, of kind of manipulating, ethically manipulating the manipulator into signing an agreement. So I call it an ethical manipulation because you're just taking information that you have and using it against them. And all narcissists are liars and do things that you can definitely use against them. So, you know, you're just trying to get back to what's fair. A lot of people say, I, I don't want to fight. I, I don't want to spend a lot of money. If you feel that way, then you've got to create leverage.